Thank you.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Adrian Jones, and I am an assistant professor of political science here at Morehouse College. And I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership's panel on moral and political dimensions of this high stakes election. Um, I hope to have three Morehouse graduates with me today who are either running for office or who are incumbent. Professor Emeritus Robert Michael Franklin, Professor of Social Ethics and Senior Fellow at the Center for Study and Religion at Emory University and former president of Morehouse College. He is running to complete the term of John Lewis in the U.S. House of Representatives representing the 5th Congressional District of Georgia. Um, I also have with me Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, senior pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, who is running for one of two open Senate seats um, this year in Georgia. And uh, we hope to have join us Mayor Stephen L. Reed, the current and first black mayor of the city of Montgomery, Alabama. I had extensive uh, introductions planned, but I'm not going to deliver those because Reverend Warnock has been nice enough to keep his appointment with us today. Despite having had his schedule change, he needs to join the Biden team um, at an event in Atlanta today where he will receive his formal endorsement for the candidacy um, to the U.S. Senate. I will say that our conversation is framed by Dr. Franklin's uh, most current book, Moral Leadership, Integrity, Courage, and Imagination. And in that book, President Franklin argues that democracy requires virtue. And he maintains that throughout history, when human communities have faced seemingly insurmountable changes, challenges, I'm sorry, insurmountable challenges, women and men with integrity, courage, and imagination have helped to move them forward. So my main questions for the panelists today are, is it possible to be a moral and ethical elected official, particularly at this time when it seems that we are enjoying insurmountable cha challenges? And I hope that our panelists will pepper in um, how Morehouse College has influenced their current service and their um, intended service once they are elected uh, for office. This is an incredibly um, exciting and um, important election, probably the most important of our generation. Um, all of the major issues are on the table from uh, racial justice to uh, police brutality, uh, the environment, women's rights, um, we are coming, we are one day after the seating of a new Supreme Court justice on the Republican side um, at the Supreme Court, which threatens all of the issues that I've just mentioned, healthcare, the economy, racial justice, um, our dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic um, and our environment. <clears throat> this year, of course, is the first year that a Black woman um, has been nominated by the major party to become the Vice President of the United States. It is also a year um, in which Georgia may turn blue um, after not having been, after having been solidly red um, since 1992 when Bill Clinton won the state. Um, all of the races this year are affected by the presidential race. And um, so that contest right now in Georgia is extremely tight. And so we are looking to make sure that people turn out to vote. Um, I want to start off with Reverend Warnock. Um, we want to make sure we maximize our time with you. Why the Senate? And do you think you can bring ethical and moral leadership to a chamber where it seems like there has not been much of that recently? Well, thank you so very much. It's always great to be in any conversation that involves Morehouse College. Uh, I was getting ready for the debate the other day and um, a younger Morehouse brother graduate asked me, I, I think he was just uh, uh, you know, teasing me a bit. He said, have you ever been in a debate with a Morehouse man? And uh, I wondered what were they doing during his time at Morehouse because we spent most of our time 
uh, I got in more interesting debates outside of the classroom as, as much as inside the classroom. I don't know that Morehouse men did much other than, than engage one another uh, in a loving way, but in a way that, that tested us and pushed us and made us better. I'm so deeply honored uh, to be uh, here with uh, the Reverend Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, who wears so many hats and uh, is a mentor and example for so many of us. I'm grateful for the ways in which he is both writing and embodying moral leadership uh, at such a critical time in our nation. Uh, and uh, Mayor Stephen Reed, uh, who graduated a few years behind me. So I guess I'm the man in the middle here. Uh, uh, the first black mayor of Montgomery, Alabama, and all that that represents uh, when you think about what Montgomery means to the world and to the country in terms of the launch of the civil rights movement, a young Martin Luther King Jr. And after all of these years, uh, Mayor Reed sits in that seat and is doing such an amazing job. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. It's possible to bring integrity and moral leadership to the Senate. Uh, indeed, we must. And um, this is why I've decided to run. You know, sometimes folks ask me, why would the pastor get involved in politics and, and run for the U.S. Senate? Why would you, um, you know, get into into politics? It's such a messy uh, business. And it is. It is. And I, I, I say, well, I'm going to put on my moral scuba, scuba gear and dive into the mix uh, because I think that the stakes are so very high. It's hard to overstate how much is at stake at stake in this defining moment in our country and Morehouse men always step up. We don't step back uh, and we don't stand by. <laughs> we, we get engaged uh, in ways that bring the best of the human spirit uh, to the issues of our time. And so I'm, um, I'm honored. Let me, let me put this, I guess, in a couple of perspectives. Um, you know, I, I hail from a church, Ebenezer Baptist church founded in 1886. We've only had five senior pastors. Martin Luther King was a co-pastor there alongside his father. I see my work and my launch into this campaign as a part of the continuing moral work that Ebenezer has tried to do in the public square. Martin Luther King Jr. is the, is the clearest and most prominent example of that. But the history of Ebenezer, um, several of whose pastors have been Morehouse men, is, is a living de demonstration of the ways in which all of us do the moral work that we're called to do in our time. And then we pass the baton on just as it's been passed on to us by a generation prior. Dr. King, when people think of Ebenezer, they think of Dr. King. What, what not enough people know is that in 1935, Daddy King led a voting rights campaign in Atlanta. In Atlanta, 1935, Martin Luther King Sr. fighting for voting rights. The voting rights law was passed in 1965 under the leadership of his son. Um, but his son is not some singular heroic genius who springs out of nowhere and ex nihilo out of nothing. He's part of a moral tradition. And even before Daddy King and the voting rights campaign in 1935, the second pastor of Ebenezer, Martin Luther King Jr.'s maternal grandfather, A.D. Williams, fought for the first public high school in Atlanta for black children, the Booker T. Washington High School. Yeah. So so without the advocacy of, a, of an Ebenezer uh, in the 1920s, voting rights campaign in 1935, voting rights law passed in 1965. My run for the U.S. Senate is a part of that ongoing moral work necessary to help perfect the union um, and the recognition that if you're engaged in a project that you can complete in your lifetime, that project is too small. Uh, the work that I'm trying to do is longer and larger than my own lifespan. And I'm just grateful to be a, a runner in this race at this defining moment 
in which we're pushing against the xenophobic, bigoted forces in our country, leaders, so-called leaders, who have no vision, and so they engage in division. Uh, and so I think it's important uh, for all of us to step up. And can you talk to us a little bit about your intentions once you arrive at the Senate, and um, in particular about um, issues of economic challenge today, both for Black people generally and um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? We have, uh, we're dealing with several issues, any one of which in, in an ordinary time would define an election, and we're dealing with all of them at once. A once in a century global pandemic, which has created an economic turndown, the likes of which we haven't seen since the Great Depression. That's number two. Uh, number three, a renewed reckoning around the issue of race embodied in these tragic flashpoints that we saw this summer George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery exhibited by fires on the West Coast and floods on the East Coast. And then number five, an all out assault, it seems to me, on the very institutions of our democracy uh, uh, by those sitting in the highest levels of our government. Any one of those in an ordinary time would define an election. We're dealing with all five of them at once. Um, and so into this mix, um, um, uh, is my candidacy and Dr. Franklin's candidacy and the work that Mayor Reed is doing. Uh, I plan to lead on health care. Uh, I've been fighting for health care for years. Uh, uh, in the best of the Morehouse tradition, the Kingian tradition, I was arrested in the state capitol years ago fighting, trying to get Georgia to expand Medicaid. Uh, we now have 500,000 people in the Medicaid gap in Georgia. We've got 1.8 million Georgians with pre-existing conditions. I'm running against a Republican senator, unelected, who's warming that seat up till I get there, and a congressperson who's being who's challenging her. They both want to get rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. So I'm leading there. Number two, economic justice. Uh, people are suffering, and we haven't seen relief, COVID relief in months while people are facing evictions, losing their jobs, not sure how they're going to make ends meet. And then number three, um, as I think about the integrity of our democratic institutions, all of the, the things that that diminish the voices of the people, I'm going to push against. So namely, both voter suppression and the outsized impact of corporate monies in our system, corporate power, all of these things make our democracy less democratic. Voter suppression. When politicians pick their voters rather than the voters picking the politicians, as we're seeing in Georgia, uh, that makes our system less democratic. And when corporate voices, corporate power has an outsized impact in our politics, when corporations are seen by the Supreme Court as people and money is seen as speech, as was the decision in Citizens United. We make the system less democratic and make it difficult to get things done, even on the air, in the areas that we agree on. Americans agree more than you would think, even on gun safety, for example, on climate change, not on everything, but there's more agreement than as is reflected in the legislation that gets passed. Why? Because of the outsized impact of lobbyist corporate power. And so what I hope to do is help to restore integrity to the process. Thank you. And uh, do you think that the similarity between voters is going to enable you uh, when you win this race to represent all Georgians? You know, we perceive ourselves today as very polarized. Um, what do you say to a, a voter who <laughs> might assume that they are more progressive than you are, the minister of a historical church, um, someone who whose views and needs uh, might include being a part of the LGBT community or um, they're interested in having uh, reproductive rights. Um, what say you to those voters who might not support you in this race once you win and you are representing them um, from the state of Georgia? Um, look, I, I think that I disagree, that means that democracy is working. Um, 
you know, that's the American covenant we have with one another, e pluribus unum, out of many one. And politics is what is it that we can get? What's, what can we possibly get done for the most people um, in the best and, and most practical ways? And so I think the idealism ought to push us and the reality um, that we, with which we are wrestling ought to ground us. And some, somewhere between being firmly grounded in the reality of where we live, res limited resources, the coalition bill, um, we try to get something done. You know, Howard Thurman said that above the heads of her students, Morehouse holds a crown that she challenges them to grow tall enough to wear. I think that statement not only applies to Morehouse, but I would apply it to the American nation at this defining moment. Um, you're looking at a kid who grew up in public housing, one of 12 children, I'm number 11, the first college graduate in my family. I often say that I came to Morehouse on a full faith scholarship. I knew I was gonna pay for the first semester. Um, but here I am and now running for the US Senate. What does that mean? It means for me that the American dream is still very much alive. It's just slipping away from too many people. And our job is to push us toward a more perfect union. By providing health care for all, we can fight about how to get there. But health care is a human right. By providing economic dignity and giving people a voice in their democracy. And giving workers that we're calling essential workers, actually paying them an essential wage. Thank you. Hello, welcome there. I'm getting feedback. Um, can I, uh, are you going to be willing, Reverend Leonard, to work across the aisle once you get to Congress? Do you think that that's going to be possible um, in today's environment? And then I just wanted to ask you about your concerns about um, the post election fallout. Um, if we do not have a landslide victory for um, the in this particular election. And um, do you have any concerns about uh, violence in our state or in others related to the current election? I'm sorry, was that question for me or someone else? It is for you. Yeah, I, I think we've got to push hard against the forces that are seeking to divide us uh, and to sow chaos. And folks who expect you know, apparently are, are worried about their prospects in the election. And so they're already pouring, you know, salt into the results. And what we've got to do in this moment is stand up um, and remind our people, and when I say our people, I mean all of our people, the American people, that at the end of the day, we've all we got. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm saying as the pastor who's running in, in the Senate race. And I mean that for Democrats and Republicans across racial lines, ideological lines, we really are all we've got. And we can't get away from one another. If we didn't know it before, I think a deadly airborne pandemic in which my neighbor coughs and I'm particular, and I'm, and I am, uh, uh, perhaps imperiled by my neighbor's cough. Like that's a sermon right there. That's what happens when you talk to a preacher. I'm imperiled by my neighbor. I have I have a vested stake in my neighbor's cough when I'm dealing with a, glo a global airborne disease. So, it's, so if my neighbor is uncovered, they may be the one without insurance. They may be uncovered, but I might be unprotected. Dr. King said, we're tied in a single garment of destiny. And so I think behind the public policy debates, the really most fundamental question before the American public at this time is, do we want to become a more hateful, divided nation, afraid of one another, and everybody armed to the hilt to protect yourself from your neighbor? Or do we want to build what Dr. King called uh, the beloved community. I think it's nonviolence or non-existence. And um, that's both the moral challenge and the practical reality set before us in this moment.
so sorry. President Franklin, um, you're in the midst of what has now become a runoff uh, for the end of the term for John Lewis in the 10th Congressional District. Um, can you talk to us about um, what you plan to do in that office if you are able to win the runoff um, in December? And um, you know, how will you bring moral leadership? And because the term at that point will only be 33 days, what do you expect to be able to do within um, that short period of time? Well, thank you, uh, Professor Jones, and to uh, Dr. Jan Adams and the leadership team at the Andrew Young Global Leadership Center, to President Thomas and all of the team at Morehouse College. It's a real pleasure to be with you and uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, future Senator Raphael Warnock, uh, who I think just had to sign off as he was en route to a uh, Biden event. And, and now reappearing uh, mysteriously as Morehouse men do, and happily. And to my dear friend uh, and, and, and younger brother and Morehouse man, Mayor Stephen Reed, we are so, so proud of you, brother. And uh, of course, Mo Montgomery, Alabama has a special place in the hearts of all uh, Morehouse uh, members and family members because of the story and the drama that unfolded. Some of our students may not even be aware that Montgomery, Alabama is the location, and I know you will talk about this, so I don't want to steal your thunder, of the famous Montgomery bus boycott. So when you hear about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and 1955, this is the story and this is the leader, the man who now provides vision for that city. But back to Professor uh, Jones's uh, important question. And I want to commend her. I hear students raving about your teaching and your modeling, uh, Professor Jones. And as I, I see and hear you, I am reminded of the leaders who taught political science at Morehouse during my days, the great and venerable Robert Brisbane and, and Abraham Davis. And, and uh, there's many, Rashad Holloway, there's many leaders who um, many of whom have passed off the scene. So you come along and carry the torch forward and it's absolutely exciting. 33 days, what difference can a month make? I would submit there is a number of leadership, of legislative priorities. Uh, future Senator Warnock has just identified them, so I won't rehearse them, but I'll name the thematic areas because they have to do with protecting and providing COVID relief as soon as possible. I hope that this will occur this week, certainly soon as Speaker Pelosi brings that uh, the, that set of measures forward in ne negotiation with uh, the White House. Who knows what this rather cowardly and corrupt GOP Senate will do. They found it more compelling and important to rush forward a divisive Supreme Court nomination than to attend to the suffering and the needs of individuals, families, and small businesses, state and local uh, governments and tribal governments and others. So I would want a message on that, would meet with leadership, would seek to ensure that we have an ongoing pipeline of stimulus relief. Second is the focus on Voting Rights Acts. So many of you will know happily that the Voting Rights Act is now named in honor of John Lewis. So it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. That needs to be passed. What does it do, the advancement part of that uh, act? It restores a number of protections and measures and requirements that were removed in 2013 with the Shelby case. The Supreme Court ruled that no longer do state and local governments throughout the former Confederacy have to get preclearance or permission to change their voting policies and practices. And 24 hours after that Shelby case was uh, became the law of the land, we saw voter suppression measures enacted. We can talk more about that, but I want people to be aware of how why this is, as you have uh, named this, uh, this focus, this panel, high stakes, high stakes election, restoring that Voting Rights Act. And then the third for me in, in importance would be the uh, what's now called the George, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to create a new culture of accountability uh, in law enforcement. And the final thing I would say here uh, is that 
what I will do, so I'm, I'm meeting, I've already begun to cut contact foundation presidents around the nation to convene leaders who can engage in what we used to call at the Ford Foundation, rapid response financial assistance to try to mobilize programs around the fifth district and it's 790,000 people that can target, and for instance, uh, ensuring that young children of color and all children are reading at their grade level uh, as they go forward. But I have written a series of messages, what I'm calling appeals. And as I say that, I want those of you who are familiar with this name, David Walker, and David Walker's appeal of 1829. I have a series of appeals that I would like to deliver from the floor of Congress in the spirit of Morehouse College and all HBCUs to challenge the nation to do the right thing at a time of great suffering and injustice. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Reed, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. I introduced, um, I tried to keep the introductions here short because Reverend Warnock did have to leave um, to take part in a rally with President um, presidential candidate Biden. And um, I had pointed out that we are framing this discussion around uh, President Franklin's latest book about moral leadership. And I asked the question about whether or not it was possible to bring morality and ethics to elected office. I also indicated that I want you to, wherever uh, you see fit, integrate your Morehouse experience into um, how that leads you to serve um, and what, you know, how does that influence and color your service as mayor? You are in the city of Montgomery, um, where the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., also an alum, did begin the Mo Montgomery bus boycotts. Um, it's a city that has a deep Confederate history and, um, you know, in involved challenges to Black people, civil rights in particular. Um, why did you run for the mayor? And um, why is it important that you're a black mayor there in Montgomery, Alabama? Well, Dr. Jones, first, um, thank you for allowing me to, to be a part of this. I wanna thank all those, uh, Andrew Young, uh, Global Lead Center for Global Leadership uh, for their um, involvement and really for their contributions, not only to what happens at Morehouse College and in Atlanta, but throughout uh, this nation and, and the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on with um, future Senator uh, Dr. Raphael Warnock. I was just talking about him earlier this morning as being one who came and did a ecumenical service for us um, last year prior to my uh, being uh, sworn in as mayor in November uh, to the pastor of True Divine Baptist Church here. And what I was telling him, it's, it's, it's interesting how God works. Last year, Dr. Warnock was bringing us together and telling us what we should look for and how uh, we could come together as a community in this chapter politically. And now here he is on the cusp himself of making history and bringing about greater change. And so I'm, I'm proud to uh, be his brother. I'm proud to uh, be affiliated, associated with him and his leadership. And I am cheering on and supportive of his candidacy and wish I could cast a vote uh, from my old address over there on 830 Westview Drive for uh, Dr. Warnock in this time. And the same goes for uh, our esteemed brother and former president, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, um, all of his contributions and leadership, uh, not only just as president at Morehouse, but as a uh, student leader, as an activist, uh, as an educator. And uh, you know, when, when you're on a panel with uh, scholars and, and uh, theologians like, like these gentlemen, uh, you want to keep your words short because I'm neither of the two. So I'm just glad to, to be on and, and really uh, you know, want to bring a, a sense of Dr. Franklin's book and kind of the, uh, the, the backbone of that about moral leadership. I, I think that if there was any time that called for moral leadership in our nation, that time is now. And I think certainly uh, it is one that not only is needed in politics is needed uh, in capitalism. It's needed in academia, it's needed in medicine, it's needed in uh, police reform, in our courtrooms. Uh, moral leadership is needed 
uh, now more than ever, because I believe that we have fallen into a false sense of security in terms of what that really means. We confuse charity for chance, and that's not the same thing. And Dr. King talked about that uh, many decades ago, and many other uh, scholars continue to uh, press us on bringing about a more equitable society and not just one that is uh, focused on equality. We know the difference between the two, and I think the moral uh, component of that means that we have to make sure that we are willing to do those things that are right and do right by people uh, who have been treated unjustly uh, in ways that may not be uh, politically expedient, in ways that may not be uh, convenient for those on one side or the other. And so I, to answer your question, I certainly believe that moral leadership can be brought uh, to uh, politics and to governance. I think it is needed and necessary across the board. And I think that has been articulated uh, very well by Dr. Franklin and by Dr. Warnock. And so it's important for us, I think, as leaders in any space to keep in mind uh, what at heart is our core. Um, my father has a saying that there is nothing politically right that is morally wrong. And it is something that he has said for all of our lives as, as I can uh, remember. And it's one of those things that I think has been lost in the conversations or the screaming matches that seem to be taking place uh, right now uh, in the halls of Washington. And, and my uh, support certainly is there with Dr. Franklin because I think when you ask what can be accomplished in 33 days, it took less than that for the Senate Republicans just to nominate and confirm uh, a Supreme Court justice for a lifetime appointment. So we know that every day counts uh, in, in this day and age at all levels of government because we see that it is a uh, take no prisoners approach, unfortunately, that has superseded that of which is moral, that is which is correct. And so what I mean by that is if you are uh, a Mitch McConnell, you have no sense of being uh two faces we used to say or speaking with the fourth tongue as my uh grandmother would say when it comes to how you apply rules right now when it comes to confirming a supreme court justice versus what took place uh under president obama's leadership in 2016. we see that even in the uh, uh, lindsey graham who was running for the united states senate there is no morality there uh, when you can say one thing bold face uh, and then turn around and do something else just months later. There can be no sense of, of a moral high ground when you support a president who will say racist and bigoted things as this president has done. And so I think if there is a time that there needs to be more of that brought back to uh, our discourse, it is now. And one of the reasons why I decided to run for mayor was simply because uh, I, I was tired of the excuses. I learned uh, at Morehouse that we were called to do more. I learned at Morehouse that we were expected to, to do more in our communities, not just exist, but to lead and to act. And one of the things that I took away, not only from our professors, not only from uh, past alumni who will come back to share their experiences with us, whether that was on Wall Street or Main Street. Uh, but I learned from my brothers, my classmates, uh, who were coming from all walks of life, not just from around this country, but throughout the world to Morehouse to get an education, not just in academics, but in manhood. And it's, it's one that people uh, can't quite understand until they talk to Morehouse, they understand a little bit more about what our matriculation there really entailed. And that has certainly been with me, whether that was my first job out of Morehouse at uh, American Airlines as a financial analyst, whether it was as a uh, small businessman and entrepreneur running my own uh, franchises, or whether or not it was uh, in the halls of state government as a staffer and certainly as a, as a judge, chief election official, and now mayor. And so, all those experiences, I think, are things that have become a part of my DNA 
uh, because of my experience at Morehouse. And so when we talked about bringing about change in Montgomery, Alabama, bringing about change in uh, the New South and how to write a new narrative for our city, we thought about, well, if we can't get that done, then we need to find a way in order to make that happen. And I decided uh, after talking with, with families, certainly after much prayer and deliberation, that I thought I could be the best leader for this community to write a new narrative and new chapter one that certainly uh, has one devoted to um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a class of 48, and his work here, his work at Dexter Avenue, King Memorial Baptist Church, and then moving on from there. And I think what I understood, even having the opportunity to uh, listen to former Atlanta Mayor Maynard Jackson and meet and talk with him over the years, was that this is a relay. And that it, it was my turn to uh, take the baton and to try to run as far with as I could to bring about more change and more equity and more opportunity for those who have been left behind in the first 200 years of this city's history. And I think as the, the first black mayor, there is a different level of responsibility and, and I accept that um, respectfully. You know, there is a level uh, of understanding I believe that I have in terms of not only the history of this city, but the present and the future. And it's one that I think makes all of our opportunities here in Montgomery and in Alabama and throughout um, one that's more possible. So it's good to be an example. Uh, it's good to be a first, but ultimately what I want to be is the best. And that again goes back to our standards that we set at Morehouse and how we compete with one another what we learn from each other and how we challenge one another to be better than maybe we can even imagine ourselves being. And Dr. Franklin, you talked a little bit about um, having a series of, series of appeals that you wanted to bring um, to the house during your time there. Could you tell us, uh, could you drill down on that a bit and tell us more specifically about um, the most important of those appeals that you'll be bringing? Wonderful question. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor uh, Reed, for that extraordinary accounting of how you made the decision uh, to, to run. I just, as I answer your question, Professor Jones, and as I try to follow some of the uh, comments being posted, which are wonderful comments from the Morehouse family and faculty, and trustees, and other uh, members of our community, uh, I want to just show you, I don't know how well you may be able to see it, but this is the program from John Lewis's funeral. And on the inner page is that 26 year old photograph of John Lewis who delivered a, the, uh, one of the speeches at the March on Washington, that extraordinary occasion, young, young brother. But at the very end, and this uh, wonderful program book contains so many pictures, is that memorable photograph of John Lewis standing in Black Lives Matter Boulevard uh, right in front, if you can see it in the background, the White House is there. And the power of these, this alignment of symbols, as a student of religion and philosophy and politics, I'm especially interested in the power of symbols. But John Lewis, who fought for democracy, who was brutalized, he was bruised for our social iniquities and chastised for American racism. And there's Black Lives Matter, the declaration of younger people, students saying our lives matter in the face of police misconduct. And then the White House, that house that houses the chief executive specified in Article Two of the Constitution and uh, constructed by African-American people and slaves as Michelle Obama reminded us. I made a similar decision as Mayor Reed and no doubt as Senate, future Senator Warnock. The weekend after that funeral, I sat there in Ebenezer Baptist Church, Dr. Warnock's church on Thursday, July 30. That day, New York Times published John Lewis's final statement to the world. Go back, Google it. And instead of reading it, that's good. If you have a chance to hear Morgan Freeman read the words of John Lewis, 
Google that because that's what you'll really enjoy. I mean, what, what, you never want to miss a chance to hear Morgan Freeman's voice, right? So uh, Morgan Freeman reads John Lewis's letter and he's addressing younger people, leaders like Mayor Reed and, and even younger and the post millennials. And the opening title is Together You Can Redeem the Soul of America. And so I segue to the point about Dr. Franklin, what would you do during those days? I've already talked about legislative advocacy and standing in the authority of John Lewis's space to declare support for additional COVID relief and hope hero support for the Voting Rights Act, named in honor of John Lewis, protecting and removing the Shelby uh, 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 measures at suppression, and then the Justice in Policing Act to create a new culture of police accountability, even on this day where protests are happening in the streets of Philadelphia because of the unwarranted murder of another black body. So Professor Jones, my first message would be John Lewis is watching. And that would be a way to sort of frame Particularly, now note when this occasion would occur. So my runoff election is on Tuesday, December 1st, almost a month after next week's general uh, election where we hope to elect uh, a senator-elect, Warnock, and so many others, and a person who would be my successor for a new term, State Senator Nakima Williams in the 5th Congressional District. But for that critical period, it is almost Shakespearean. The final days of John Lewis's term overlap with what we believe will be the final days of Donald Trump's administration. That is Shakespeare. That is the juxtaposition of good and evil, of right and wrong. And part of the power of what moral leaders do, and I tried to elaborate this in this little book you can read overnight, Moral Leadership, Integrity, Courage, and Imagination, Morehouse is all through the book, but it's not just Morehouse. It's, it's what it means to be a person of integrity, courage, and imagination that serves the common good and invites others to join. So I write about Ella Baker, about Dolores Huerta, about Cesar Chavez, and about Martin Luther King, among others. And one brother in my class of 1975 from Morehouse wants to give a copy of this book to every member of Congress just to jumpstart the conversation. Thank you, Brother Dobbs. But you know, the, the subsequent messages would address topics like with justice, with liberty and justice for all, where we talk about policing and, uh, and addressing the questions of uh, immunity that police uh, enjoy and, and on and on. Another message on reparations. The key to repairing our house, a divided house, is to take seriously the message. And I commend Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey and uh, House, House member Representative uh, Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas for introducing the John Conyers work. Over every year, John Conyers would remind us and introduce, people thought he was crazy. Now the idea is finding its moment in the sun. So those are just three of the messages I would bring forward and basically would be lecturing them about moral leadership, do the right thing. And even those senators, because the problem is on the Senate side right now, which is why this is high stakes and why Warnock and John Ossoff in Georgia are so important. Uh, the, the, the key is many of them will be defeated next week. They will be lame duck senators. I would like to stand in the gap on at the John Lewis mantle of moral authority and say, let history write its last word about you as you leave the U.S. Senate, as you leave the House, in that you supported the Voting Rights Act, the Justice and Policing Act, the HEROES COVID Relief Act, the Reparations Bill. Support something that will place you in history in a favorable light. And that's what I would like to do and to ask the support and the prayers of the Morehouse Spellman and HBCU family around the nation. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Reed, 
Um, I was hoping you would talk to us a little bit about your work on the ground. Um, you know, this has been an extremely intense year um, involving both uh, protests for the untimely and um, inappropriate deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, among others. Um, we're in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I was hoping that you could shed some light on as mayor, um, you know, running all the different aspects of the city. How have you managed that? And um, what's involved? You know, how have you used imagination and courage in order to uh, bring some order and relief for your city citizens? Acknowledging the fact that while I'm wearing uh, this mask, and, and it is the, the mask from uh, the memorial service for the late Congressman John Lewis in Troy, Alabama, his hometown, which is less than 50 miles from Montgomery. And as Dr. Franklin was speaking and, and pointing out, not just his uh, program, but his contributions and his legacy. And again, I think um, picking up the baton in his absence, it just made me reach over to, to uh, put this mask on just as a way for us to, to pay tribute to the legacy and contributions of someone like Congressman Lewis who served on the Atlanta City Council uh, prior to, to going into um, the United States Congress. And, and it's important for us to keep those things in mind as I remove this because at the local level, as you say, you know, being a, a, as the mayor of Montgomery, uh, the local leadership is very important. And I think that it's become even more important with some of the gridlock that we've seen at the uh, federal level. And often we don't think about the importance of that. And when we think about the policies at the state level, you know, we're dealing in challenging times in part because we uh, may have became so enamored by having our first black president in 2008 that we took our, ball, our eye off the ball in 2010. And we forgot how many laws and how much policy uh, is impacted at the state level. And what we've seen from the other side, in my opinion, is a shift from really pushing their agenda uh, at the national level to moving state by state. And so uh, I wanna start by saying that for those that are in Georgia, pay attention to who's running for a state representative, pay attention to who's running for state Senate. Uh, Georgia, I think is about 16 seats short of taking over the house. Uh, that's very important because after this, uh, they will be drawing the legislative district for the next 10 years on the census. So we have to keep in mind the uh, the analytics, the, the science of politics as well, not just the personalities of this. And I wish that we were that close here in Alabama where our GOP controlled legislature uh, has a super majority, which means we can't even uh, filibuster uh, those efforts that, that come up. Those things matter because at the local level, mayors like myself and mayors like our Morehouse brother Randall Whitman uh, in Birmingham are impacted. Uh, by our state legislatures, in particular in the South, where many of the legislatures have uh, an enormous amount of power because cities do not have home rule, per se. Cities have to go to the legislature uh, to change many laws and ordinances of any consequence. And so it's important for us to keep those things in mind that before there was a congressman, John Lewis, there was a city councilman, John Lewis, and no different than before there was a mayor, Stephen Reed, there was a probate judge Stephen Reed. And so we want to keep those things uh, in front of us because whether we're talking about COVID or we're talking about police reform or we're talking about uh, sentencing reform and the, the effort to privatize prisons and the prison industrial complex and many other things that are impacting all of our communities, but certainly the black community disproportionately, it's important for us to have strong leadership up and down the ballot and for us to be educated and aware of, of those issues. And so while everybody may not be able to be a uh, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin uh, and serve as, as president and serve as uh, in our professorship at Emory and, and run for Congress, uh, there are ways to serve, there are ways to activate uh, what I believe we're called to do as Morehouse men. And what I've learned in this, uh, 2020 year from uh, another uh, dimension or so it seems is that we have to be prepared for uh, the unexplainable and the unpredictable. And that's where we have been thrust in 
as mayors and as leaders, I think for many of us, whether you're Dr. Thomas and you're leading a, a college uh, such as Morehouse through this period of time, or you're leading an organization uh, as well, all of this has called upon us to be able to adapt, to show courage and to show true leadership. One of the things that I've said has been that, you know, leaders are not defined by what they do when, when times are good. Leaders are defined by what they do when times are bad. And what we have done is we've led uh, by being very transparent, by being trusted, and by really showing our community that we have their best interests first, irrespective of politics. Uh, and again, whether that's COVID or whether that is the social unrest that occurred after um, the George Floyd murder, we have tried to be out front and we have tried to be very consistent in our message to our community. And I want to say this to uh, many of the uh, millennials and the Gen Z's and everyone else uh, that's out there. I, I give a lot of credit um, to the Black Lives Matter movement because I don't know that we have seen a movement like this that has pushed those of us in political office and even those in corporate suites as far as fast, probably since uh, the 60s and the movements after that. I certainly don't think that my class and my generation did the same thing in the wake of the Rodney King beating in LA. Uh, when I think back to our times, I think that we had some sparks, but we were never able to create the change that the Black Lives Matter movement has brought about. And I also give a lot of credit to the elders um, who have been willing to guide and listen uh, and assist them along the way, because that's what it takes for us to really uh, make this nation be all that it can be, is for us to push policymakers, uh, for us to bring about ideas uh, from the grassroots to the grass tops that are going to make this country uh, truly be all for all. And it hasn't obviously been that way. And so as mayor, what we've tried to do, and I think what we have done is to put the data, put the experts out front, listen to the guidance on uh, whether it's COVID-19 related or whether it's even related to police community interaction. Let's put the data out there. If we need to establish a citizens review board, let's do that. If we need to hear from the community leaders about what has been the relationship uh, between our community and our police department, then we need to listen and talk. We need to listen more and talk less so that we can achieve those outcomes that we all desire. That's been our approach as, as mayor of Montgomery. Uh, and I think that approach has served us well. And I think for a city like Montgomery, we've shown that uh, nonviolent peaceful protests can still be a powerful tool, as Dr. King talked about so many years ago, even in today's era, that we can have discussions, we can get our point across, and we can make sure there's change when there's willingness uh, on both sides to hear one another out and then act on it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my mute That's button, okay. trying to stay out of the way while you all are speaking. Um, I wanted to point out to people before I turn the floor over to President Franklin um, for some closing remarks that this election season is allowing us to see a number of different types of elections. Um, you know, you, President Franklin, are in a special election. Um, Reverend Warnock is in this jungle primary where all of the candidates are on the ballot. Oh, and I'd like to mention that if you are in support of Reverend Warnock, that his name is relatively low down on the ballot. Um, so I think that his campaign always wants to remind people to make sure that you take a look. Um, I also noticed that in your race for um, mayor, um, you were in a primary and then you engaged in a runoff, um, both of which you came out the winner, but um, having not earned 50% in the first round, um, you know, you went back in and you were able to win 67% um, of the vote there. Um, and I say that just to have people notice and to encourage them to get out and vote. Voting in Georgia is still um, open early until the 30th. And um, it's important for us right now with the long lines and the um, voter suppression issues that we've seen in, in the state of Georgia for people to inform their friends and colleagues about um, locations in their counties where the lines are not oppressive right now. 
Um, if you don't get out before early voting, we want to make sure that you get out on November 3rd um, and cast your vote, um, not only for the presidential election, which is having a strong influence on all of the down ticket elections, but to the mayor's point, um, for these local and state races that really do have a strong impact on our real lives every day in ways that might not um, have the same effect in our relationship um, with the president. Um, president Franklin, did you want to um, give us some closing thoughts about what the mayor, um, what the Senator-elect um, has said, and the commentary that you yourself had made in relationship to being moral and ethical in office, and of course, to being a Morehouse graduate hmm. and um, leader in service. Professor Jones, I wanna thank you again for your stellar leadership and convening and helping to guide our conversation. This has been rich. Uh, it's, it's, it's wrapping up too soon. I think people are really interested in this material. Uh, and, and if he were wise, President Trump would be watching so he can learn something about uh, all, true governance and moral leadership. Uh, I actually want to, as a selfish matter, I asked Mayor Reed, give, give me your best advice about how to win a, a runoff election. But maybe we can do that offline. <laughs> Let's see, Professor Jones, you're muted. I, I want to hear I what you say. Have time, um, for you to talk about winning a runoff, please. Yeah, could you give us give us like a minute on that, and then I can offer some comments. Well, well, uh, Dr. Franklin, I, you know, the best thing I can tell you is something you're already doing. That that is one to pray. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's that's number one, and you, you got to pray for God's will to be done, and you hope His will is is your will. Yes, sir. Uh, you pray. I like that. Slide. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think the main thing is what we try to tell people all the time, because the other side counts us out, is that it is not finished until it truly is complete. And we try to remind people there is a runoff election. And you go back to your base and you you, you remind them uh, of why they came out the first time. Mm -hmm. And you got to let them know that it's just like anything else. It's a sequel. You got to cut them out for mm -hmm. part two to really see the full conclusion of it. And I think if you do that the way you already reach folks, uh, then you'll be successful in it. And I have no doubt that you will be and the people uh, of the Congressional District will come out a second time around and support you. Thank you, brother. That's that's br brilliant. There is a sequel. I'm going to hold on to that. You enjoyed well, Black Panther, the movie one. Look for the sequel. It's coming. You know, it's uh, and I mentioned um, that we have these different elections, and so I do want to encourage people um, to your point, Mr. Mayor, that um, you do need to go back out on December first in order yeah. to engage in the runoff that um, President Franklin is involved in, and because if people don't turn out for the runoff. You know, you don't get the benefit of the support that exists for you um, out here in the community. Um, you know, we saw some of that in 2018. I think that there was, you know, some decrease in the support uh, for turning out for the election. Sometimes this is difficult for people, of course. You have to work. Um, you know, it's on a Tuesday. You might have to stand outside. We're in the middle of a pandemic. But I want to encourage people. Um, to remember the dates of these races and to get out there because this obviously will be a different day than the general election. And, and, doc, and Dr. Franklin, in, yeah. in all this, if, if I can jump in real quick, yes. you know, the, we, we always say that the presidential election is different than any other election, whether it's a statewide election, a local mm -hmm. election, certainly yeah. a runoff election. And the key thing is certainly in your data and your research, I believe, is to drill down and find those super voters, yeah. those voters who come out and vote for referendum one, even if it's just the only referendum on that ballot. And those are your most likely voters to come back out a uh, second time. And, and not to quote the old Shalimar song, but the second time around is truly better than the first time. <laughs> and so if you use that, focus on those super voters that always come out to vote and get your vote, get your win number, and that will that will put you in place of who you need to contact and how to get them back out to those polls in that runoff. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, Dr. I'm Jones. Making, I'm making an inquiry here too. I might be jumping the gun. I wanna make sure that we don't have any questions from the audience that mm. I'm not asking. Um, yeah. So that we can make sure that we communicate, um, you know, the answers that people wanna hear while, before yeah. we um, yeah. get off. 
So I'm just sort of um, making an inquiry about that right now. Um, let's see. I, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Mayor. Um, oh, is there a mail-in ballot? Can you mail in a ballot for the runoff election uh, for the December 1st? Uh, yes, my understanding is in fact, early voting will begin for the runoff, the congressional fifth district seat on Tuesday, November 9th. I'm sorry, Monday, November 9th. So one week one after next week, we repeat, that? One repeat that? Yes. So on Monday, November 9th, okay. early voting begins for the December 1st election to decide who goes to Congress to, to uh, be there on the final day of John Lewis's term to pronounce a benediction on his legacy, having done all the advocacy and the convening and the hard and heavy lifting. So Monday, November 9th, so get out early. This may be the only election on the ballot. It's possible that uh, the seat for the state, Georgia State Senate, may also be included, but this will be a short ballot. It'll be low turnout. That's why every one of you who can vote, can mobilize your network to vote, please ask them to come out. Yes, there will be mail-in ballot uh, opportunities as well, and we'll be messaging on that. Let me just also provide a shout out for uh, Sunday. This Sunday at Ebenezer Baptist Church will be its homecoming Sunday. And the Reverend Dr. Warnock uh, indicated when he first came on the air that uh, he's recording or has just recorded an introduction. I will be the guest speaker and will be offer some messaging about the significance of that election in the context of a homecoming. So you won't want to miss that because I'm going to be referencing Morehouse homecoming and the culture of homecoming in that. And you will, uh, you you know, it's church time, but you can pull up, your, get a bag of popcorn and enjoy what you hear Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Both. The, secondly, on Tuesday, November 10th, there'll be a uh, convening of interfaith leaders from around uh, Georgia. And I'm asking you to join. I'll be offering some comments You'll hear more about that. Look for that, but mark that down November 10th and check my website, franklin congress 2020com and you'll see the full calendar. Uh, Dr. Jones, anything else? I have like three minutes of closing remarks, but I'm going to wait until you tell me to go. We're going to let you go ahead. I think we're um, hitting up against our time. I want to thank uh, Mayor Reed for coming and um, speaking with me today and for joining the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. You know, I wanted to begin with, uh, once again, part of the Morehouse tradition is always you honor and reverence the elders and you cherish the wisdom of those who have gone before. So in 1964, Martin Luther King's book, Why We Can't Wait, he was always loving and, 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 and respectful of his elders. But listen to what he did in this little essay. I quote, until now, comparatively few major Negro leaders of talent and unimpeachable character have involved themselves actively in partisan politics. Such men as Judge William Hasty, Ralph Bunch, Benjamin Mays, A. Philip Randolph, to name but a few, have remained aloof from the political scene. Listen to what King writes. In the coming period, they and many others must move out into po political life as candidates and infuse it with their humanity, their honesty, and their vision, end quote. So King in 64 is calling for the leadership of Stephen Reed and Raphael Warnock, Robert Franklin, and so many others. And he himself is a product of an institution with faculty like Dr. Jones and, 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 and producing students. They were young students like us, Julian Bond, uh, Leroy Johnson, uh, Maynard Jackson. And the list goes on and on and on and continues to the day, indeed, this day, this panel. So I want every viewer, every participant, to think about what you can do next week to not only yourself vote, many of us have already voted, right? I'm already looking for Senator Warnock. 
because I voted for him. But I want you to think about whom else can you influence. And Stacey Abrams is trying to remind us all, everybody make a plan. Ensure that your vote gets in, gets counted, and that you mobilize another group of people. Donald Trump in 2016 won the state of Georgia at 211,000 votes, 211,000. The number of black people in Atlanta alone who were registered and did not vote in 2016 was 530,000 people. Trump wins by 211,000. And in Atlanta, I mean, not to mention Gainesville and, 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 and uh, Macon and Savannah, Atlanta alone, 530,000 eligible black voters did not vote. And so I don't want to get into victim blaming. Why are people sitting at home? Because there is suppression. So let's not just blame victims. Let's be honest, as we have done in this program, to call out suppression, hard suppression, these strange and, and rigid uh, voter ID laws and so on, as well as soft suppression. We want the lines to be long. We want the technology to fail. That'll discourage people. People will say like, sweet brown, ain't nobody got time for that. And I want to stand in those lines, stand in the line, go bring your picnic basket, your picnic chair, surrey on down to the polling place, be there, make it happen. Remember the words of, of uh, the great German poet Goethe, who said, at the moment of commitment, the entire universe conspires for your success. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank you for speaking with us today. I want to thank um, Reverend Warnock also for joining us. Um, thank you for being here. And I want to thank our audience for joining us and just give one more plug and encourage people to turn out and vote.